from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a loss for crypto lobbyists. The newly passed infrastructure bill opens the door to much tighter regulation of cryptocurrency. The CEO of Europe's largest digital currency exchange, Kraken, not happy about it. He'll tell us why. Plus, an exclusive interview with Coinbase president Emily Choi, straight off second quarter earnings. We'll get her reaction to crypto's part in that new infrastructure bill, the latest volatility, and more. And picture this, Apple's next iPhone lineup will get at least three major new camera and video recording features. Will they be enough to kickstart a super cycle? We'll talk about it all with our very own Mark Gurman. All that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta and Ed Ludlow. Kriti Tech leading the declines today, what would you pull out? Absolutely. We did see this uh, kind of an outsized reaction to just a two basis point uh, pop in yields. It's a really notable move and really signals that a lot of people are expecting the 10-year yield to rise, especially coming into that CPI print tomorrow. You saw this really with this kind of tech underperformance. The S&P 500 still up 0.1%, and that actually let it close at record highs. But I really want to zoom in on the yield picture. If we can just pull up the chart of some of the technical levels we should be watching in particular, because that's really where the 200-day moving average really comes in handy. You are looking at yields kind of hovering around that area and potentially breaking out tomorrow with that CPI print. I also want to highlight what some of the other sectors are doing, though. You have semiconductors, the NASDAQ Golden Dragon Index. You also, of course, have the uh, gold, the NASDAQ Biotech Index all down on the day in line with that tech trade. Emily, though, that could absolutely turn around tomorrow. That is the macro picture for the micro. Let's go to Ed Ludlow. Yeah, I'm just focusing on Coinbase because a really strong set of numbers for the second quarter. You can see the stock lower in after hours. It had been higher, then was flat and is now lower. Investors really trying to make up their mind about what they see because what we saw was a beat on the top line and the bottom line, but a warning that trading volumes will be lower in the current quarter. The actual trading volumes in the quarter just gone, $462 billion, the volume dollar value of how much was traded through the platform. The estimate was $381 billion, so well above that. What was interesting, they point out that the volume of Ethereum trading on the platform was greater than that of Bitcoin. Of course, we know that there were some upgrades to the Ethereum network in the quarter, transaction costs came down, and that it was basically better traded. But this is a stock that moves in lockstep with Bitcoin. Let's bring up this year-to-date chart and take a look at this. It's really fascinating. You can see that as Bitcoin kind of pared back some of its moves in recent months, if we pull up that chart, then we'll see that what happened was that you see Coinbase kind of following suit here. They're moving in kind of symmetry, similarly with the Bloomberg Galaxy Crypto Index. Most of what's happening on Coinbase right now is, is retail investor driven, 95% of the dollar value of those transactions. In recent days with this infrastructure bill, a lot of the focus is on the legitimacy. If you go on the Reddit forums, on Twitter, that's what the discussion is. Whatever the net result, policymakers on Capitol Hill talking about this is giving cryptocurrency broadly some legitimacy. And you see that reflected as well in these Coinbase numbers. If you look at Bitcoin over the last few days, just over the last 24 hours or so, we're hovering around now at a level of around 45,000. Just finally, just to say, Emily, that there's some strength in Bitcoin. It was just a few weeks ago, you and I were talking about Bitcoin 20,000. No more to the moon, Emily, because now people in the market we're talking about Bitcoin 100,000. Just to the Here moon, Ed. I think go. our next guest had some thoughts about that. Uh, Ed, thanks so much for that. And of course, we're going to be talking to Coinbase President Emily Choi later this hour. I do want to stick with crypto now. A crushing loss for the crypto lobby, pushing to change crypto tax reporting rules in that infrastructure bill. It didn't happen, opening the door to much broader regulation of the crypto industry going forward. Joining us now with Reaction Kraken CEO Jesse Powell. Jesse, your recent tweets, don't mince words. You're saying crypto is being killed in America out of spite, that this will send industry, jobs, technology offshore. Why are you, if I may say so, so infuriated by this? It's a complete disaster. Uh, how this language got into the bill in the first place, still a mystery um, that we couldn't get this amendment through to, to make some very obvious improvements that would save this industry in America is, is a real shame. And, you know, it's due to the, the holdout senator in Alabama. 
uh, that wasn't willing to support this. So it's, you know, I, I'm also disappointed with the industry and in that we didn't all come together um, on this, you know, Kraken emailed its user base calling for support to, to contact uh, their senators. And not everyone did that. You know, I think some people felt like they could rely on, on backroom conversations with, with Senate staffers. And that obviously didn't work out for us. And, um, you know, in the end, what mattered was, was probably a senator that, that nobody thought to talk to. So um, I think we all need to come together on this and going forward, really put everything we have into the, into this, into the House. Um, and, you know, now the problem is just four times bigger, right? We've got to convince 400 people instead of 100 people to do something. So we've sort of made our own lives difficult. But I think this is a wake-up call for the whole crypto industry in that we really need to start financing our lobbying effort way more, you know, 100 times more than we have been historically. So what do you personally, what does Kraken plan to do about it? How do you plan to rally the support that you're going to need? Because also this is, you know, par partly, you know, education is happening at the same time that lobbying is. Exactly. I think, you know, we all need to donate more to Coin Center and the Blockchain Association, first of all. Second, I think a lot of people in the industry are talking about how they can set up a PAC or super PAC or how the industry can come together and finance the politicians that are on our side and put more into educating those who aren't. And uh, I think you're going to see the crypto industry become a, a massive lobbying force, not just the companies, but the people who are cryptocurrency holders. And Americans broadly who see this as a national security, national economic problem, that we need to keep this industry on shore. Why do you think innovation will be stifled by this? What do you think won't happen as a result? Like, what are the real threats? Well, as it's written, the bill basically says that every time you tip a barista, you have to get a 1099. So you have to collect their name, address, phone number, social security number, proof of identity in order to give them that tip. And this is saying basically the same thing for the blockchain, that anytime anyone in, in a chain of a transaction, be it a software developer, a node operator, a Bitcoin miner, um, a wallet operator, anyone in that chain who's facilitating a transaction must collect tax information, identity information, and report to the IRS, which is just completely nonsensical, completely misunderstands the technology, and is, is not even possible, but basically makes criminals out of everyone who, who isn't doing it and effectively kills the industry and, and kills this technology in the United States, which means all of those businesses that, that are generating tremendous amounts of tax revenue, uh, all, all of these software developers, everyone, the mining industry, uh, which we have recently received a, a huge um, influx of from China, will all just have to go back out of the country because these people are, have basically um, been made to be criminals by virtue of, of being forced to do something that technically is not even possible to do. Meantime, Jesse, today the biggest hack on DeFi yet, $600 million in assets stolen. This happening on the Poly Network. I mean, when these kinds of things happen, it, it sort of screens the need for regulation for more oversight. What's your reaction to this? Isn't it alarming? It is alarming, um, but you know it's it's a bit of the wild west in crypto. People all over the world are engaged with DeFi. Uh, we try to do audits on things as much as we can. Um, some people invest in things that have not been audited. Sometimes the auditors just miss something critical. And you know, I would honestly trust the auditors that are are looking at these cryptocurrency protocols more than I would trust a government regulator to be able to catch these problems. Um, big institutions just get hacked, you know, just as much. So I don't think it's something that needs more regulation. There's already plenty of consumer regulation, consumer protection out there. Uh, the space is already regulated by the IRS, FinCEN, the SEC, the CFTC, um, you know, you name it, they're trying to regulate this space and, and they do. Uh, so I don't think it's more regulation that we need. I think it's more education that we need. And um, no matter how much education you have, some people are just gonna gamble their money and you know, we just saw a hedge fund guy who who knows exactly what he's doing lose twenty billion dollars in a day. So, you know, I, I don't think it's about um, needing more protection from this. I think it's about more education. Well, and as DeFi uh, continues to expand, you know, though, don't don't you think there are going to need to be more guardrails? No, I don't think so. I, I think we already have plenty of guardrails in place that extensively cover. Uh, financial services and, and to a great extent, cryptocurrency. And, you know, I, I think that calls for more regulation 
now I think are are short sighted, and I think we need to see how that this space develops. Um, you know, it's still the very early days. If we had tried to put too much regulation on the internet in the early days, not anticipating what could come from it, um, you know, requiring people to get KYC just to go to a website, for example, to protect them, um, you know, it wouldn't have become what it what it has today, and it wouldn't have um, enabled so much freedom and discussion around the world. And you know, that's the hope of cryptocurrency is that we bring financial freedom and inclusion to the world. And once we start putting it in a box and trying to control everything, we really take away that potential from it. So I, I think now there's there's enough regulation to protect people. And I think we need to watch and see what happens and, and help this space develop. So look, there's obviously been a lot of volatility. I'll just pick up Bitcoin in particular, just in the last few weeks. You of course have been on the show uh, talking about it going to the moon. Infinity, Mars, beyond. I mean, do we have any new metaphors given what you've seen of late? Are you still as optimistic about these, you know, otherworldly potential here? Absolutely. The, the moon is the bear case for crypto. You know, we're, we're going to other dimensions uh, with Bitcoin. So I think people just need to hold on. You know, we're still early days. We're still early in the cycle. Um, I think we could see $100,000 plus a coin um, late this year, early next year. All right, Jesse Powell, CEO of Kraken. Always appreciate the colorful metaphors. Thank you so much for joining us. Of course, later in the hour, we've got Coinbase president Emily Choi on the company's second quarter earnings report, her thoughts on the country's new infrastructure bill and much, much more. You don't want to miss it. Coming up, out with the old and in with the new. Apple plans on releasing a new iPhone with three major camera and video recording upgrades. Our own Mark Gurman with us with all the details. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Apple is getting set to release its latest iPhone. The iPhone 12 successor will include three major new camera and video recording features. This after Apple announced new controversial protections against explicit images in its messages app and iCloud photo libraries. Our own Mark Gurman here with more. So look, Mark, let's start on the new camera and video recording features. What do we know? So we know there are three main new features coming. The first is called cinema mode. If you're familiar with portrait mode that's existed on the iPhone since the 7 Plus five years ago, you can take a picture and the object or subject in the foreground will be sharp and the background will be blurred. And this is known in the ph photography world as the bokeh effect. Now they're going to be bringing this to video. It's a, uh, it's a common technique used in high-end video on high-end DSLRs. Uh, and now this will be coming to the iPhones uh, for the first time. Uh, when the new models are announced in just several weeks from now. Uh, the second feature is recording in what is known as ProRes. ProRes is a much higher fidelity, a higher quality format uh, used in the video industry. It makes editing a lot more capable uh, and, you know, and interesting for video editors. The third feature is a new AI-based photo filter system that can adjust colors and highlights and shadows uh, in pictures on individual elements of a photo, whether that's an object or a person. So quite a bit uh, more capable than your standard Instagram-like filter system. So let's talk a little bit about uh, the controversy surrounding Apple's new software targeted at these explicit images. There seems to be continuing concern about it. A lot of people don't understand it. They're just reading the headline, don't understand how it's actually going to work. What's your take on the sort of ensuing reaction that we've seen here? Yeah, I think the reaction is somewhat fair. I think there's some misunderstanding out there about how the functionality works. Apple is not actually viewing the images in your iCloud photo library. What they're doing is they're scanning or analyzing the whole library and they're assigning what are known as hash keys using a process called cryptography to each image. And those hash keys correspond to your individual images. Then there's a database operated by NCMEC. This is a institute against child exploitation, child abuse against child pornography. And they have a database of videos and photos uh, that they've collected from law enforcement agencies over the years. And what Apple is doing is they're assigning those hash keys to those images in that database as well. And so they're scanning your library and comparing the hash keys in your library to the hash keys in that database to see if there are matches. And then what Apple does, if there is a certain amount of matches in your photo library, 
and unfortunately are not telling us how many matches that is, they will then have human reviewers review those images, and if there is indeed a confirmed match, then they will notify NCMEC and then further law enforcement. What Apple should be doing is they should be providing a better explanation as to what's in this database, who manages the database, and how images get into that database. There's a lot of concern about that. I'm not going to sit here and defend you know, Apple's efforts against child exploitation and those explicit images. I don't think Apple is doing anything wrong from wanting to prevent those images. What I will say is it is slightly hypocritical to some people who say that you know, Apple refused to give up, you know, to, to break into iPhones belonging to those behind terrorist attacks, such as with San Bernardino, yet they are willing to do this against child pornography in photos. Obviously, both are bad, but some people are arguing that Apple should be working with law enforcement on, on both subjects or neither. Certainly much to debate there. Meantime, you've also got a story out about how Google is limiting ad targeting to teenagers. This is something that Instagram, uh, Facebook's Instagram did a while ago. What can you tell us about this? Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of these companies, Apple, obviously Facebook with Instagram, like you said, and Google really limiting ad targeting in some form. Obviously, earlier this year with the launch of App Tracking Transparency, or ATT, Apple limited app targeting and um, ad tracking, tracking across websites and apps across you know, the entire iOS ecosystem regardless of age. Instagram is doing it for 18 and under now uh, in, in relation to some demographics and such and interests. And now Google is doing that as well, specifically across all of their services, but with a focus on YouTube as well. And there's a number of other uh, new protocols they're putting in place to protect kids. They are stopping autoplay. So if you have kids watching YouTube, videos won't continue to play you know, in succession, you know, keep kids all night watching video. Uh, some kids in my household might be doing that, but in moderation. Bloomberg's <laughs> Mark Gurman, thank you so much for that update. Meantime, SoftBank has reported a sharp drop in profit at its vision fund. Masayoshi Sun's investment business has previously enjoyed a strong run due to the surge in tech stocks, but quarterly results for the company show the value of its investments of public holdings like Uber and Coupon have declined. However, gains for China's Didi were the main reason the business stayed profitable. And Facebook has removed two separate networks of accounts as part of an effort to crack down on inauthentic behavior. One network originated in Myanmar and was used to spread divisive content about the country's political issues. The second, from Russia, attempted to recruit real internet influencers to help spread misinformation about COVID vaccines. That network included 243 Instagram accounts with more than 24,000 followers. Coming up, travel in the time of COVID. Where can you go and which de destinations are still sealed off as the Delta variant takes over? We'll tell you next. This is Bloomberg. More earnings ahead this week. eBay and Bumble out with quarterly results Wednesday. Then Thursday, we're going to hear from Disney, Airbnb, DoorDash, and SoFi. Airbnb will be especially interesting to watch as other companies in the travel and hospitality sectors gave optimistic outlooks despite the global surge in Delta variant cases. Take a listen. People are desperate to travel. I mean, there is that demand and that hunger we see. There is a big appetite to travel. So everywhere where people can travel, we see immediately bookings Coming in. Cruise demand is strong among our guests who are thrilled to be back. We are seeing people obviously much more comfortable to be in uh, hotels, resorts, all, all the usual lodging use, use cases. We see actually an increase of demand probably in the future for leisure business demand. We will see cases in the cruise industry, but we have among the best uh, protections in the larger leisure business. While the variant is out there, um, overall, you know, we're, we're seeing bookings and we're seeing the experience accelerate. I think we'll continue to see that. I don't see Delta having a, a particularly large impact on it. For more on the reopening of travel, both in the U.S. and abroad, I'm joined by Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong. So, Drew, what's opening? What's closing down? It's a great question, which is the reason we developed this new travel restrictions tracker um, that just launched today. We really wanted to answer three questions. You know, first of all, where can you go? Uh, second of all, where is it safe to go? And third of all, is it if you go, is it is it worth it? Are bars and restaurants open? Can you do stuff? 
So we looked at 1,500 different travel combinations uh, that involve about 40 different major financial and leisure capitals, and we're able to compile ratings for every single one of those using a combination of travel data from a third party, um, a company called Sherpa, and then our own reporters on the ground and vaccine data we've collected to tell you what it's like to be there. The takeaway from this so far is that a lot of the world still is not very open. Only 18% of the countries, 18% of the places that we looked at really have our most open and most accessible uh, ratings, while a lot of the world still remains kind of in that much more closed category. So what do you see happen happening next here? I mean, do you expect that many more destinations will shut down? I mean, the numbers just seem to be getting worse around the world. Yeah, it's a great question. I think one of the reasons we did this in part was because, I mean, if you've been watching the headlines over the last week, you've seen new restrictions that could be put in place in some places and lightened in other places. I mean, this is stuff that changes very, very fast, a lot of the times depending on the public health situation on the ground. And so it makes it very hard to know where you actually can go and you know what the rules are going to be um, if you do try to make those trips. I think in general, I mean, even in the United States and elsewhere, it does certainly seem to be like for vaccinated travelers, there's a general trend toward reopening, even with some of these Delta surges that we've seen. It's not true everywhere. It's not true all the time. But clearly, you see people who are getting vaccinated and wanting to travel because they feel personally protected um, at that point. I think we heard it from some of the clips you, you all played earlier. Do you expect more countries will quickly will input restrictions, more restrictions? I have a feeling we're going to see some of that. I mean, we have been seeing, you know, the U.S. added a couple countries to its uh, warning list for travel. Um, I have a feeling we will see those types of things go on. You know, we've seen lockdowns in Australia. We've seen uh, resumption of some restrictions in China locally. So, you know, clearly this is not a one-way street. Um, and we will see as these, uh, as these waves of Delta cases, which I think we're learning can spike very quickly um, in some places when they do hit, especially in unvaccinated populations, that's going to affect right. things inevitably. So, you know, for us, this was really about trying to pinpoint the places where you can go um, and also identifying mm -hmm. those where you can't right now. It's terrifying, especially as schools are starting to reopen around the world. Uh, we'll continue to follow it. Blue, uh, Bloomberg's Drew Armstrong, thank you so much to your team uh, for continuing to bring us the most up-to-date information. Coming up, Tesla's footprint in China fading following negative publicity and the recall of almost every car sold in the country. Well, the latest on that story next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Tesla's China troubles continue with shipments of locally made cars plunging the month of July. This following a run of negative publicity and the recall of almost every car the company has sold in China. For more on the story, I want to bring in our Bloomberg News reporter, who else, but Ed Ludlow. So, you know, I think when you say it that way, it's just hard to believe that every single car in China has been recalled. Right. What exactly is happening here? Well, the numbers themselves are really important to break down because for the first time, we saw this big drop in the number of cars that are built in China in the Shanghai factory that are actually delivered to Chinese customers. You know, what's really happened over the last 12 months is that Shanghai has become the center of production for Tesla. Mm -hmm. It's no longer over the water from where we're sitting, right? It's in Shanghai. So look at that chart on your screen. The orange bar is what you're looking at. And we care about that because China is the world's biggest autos market. It's still building a lot of cars in China, but now for the first time, more of them are going overseas, mostly to Europe. That's not a bad thing because those are higher margin cars. Tesla's done a lot to localize supply chain in China. It's got super efficient factory. It makes a lot of money on those cars, but it is worrying about what it signals for the company's performance in that market. So how important is China to Tesla compared to you know, the rest of the world, right. which you know the world is their oyster, right? The United States is still its biggest market, but China was its growth market. It was the engine room for growth because it's the world's biggest auto market. The difference with China is that, and I think we have a chart which shows Tesla's revenue growth by different regions, right? The blue bars are China. You can see that for a long time in recent quarters, that's where the growth was coming from. It slowed down last quarter when these woes started happening, the kind of 
clash with consumers, regulators coming in. And is that going to continue to slow? Well, this later da latest data set is not a good sign. Um, and we know that, you know, for a long time, Tesla was the darling of the Chinese go government. They really helped the company get set up there. But now it seems as if they're going to have to do a lot better to improve the situation, not just with consumers, but to allay some of the fears the Chinese government has. Meantime, Tesla stock has been in a holding pattern. Is this in part due to the China concerns? It's hard to say. Like, the run-up in Tesla's share price over 2020 was so massive. It's now really underperforming the S&P 500. It's just in positive territory. You see there on your screen the orange line, just in positive territory year to date. So part of that is that we saw such gains last year. We're now kind of normalizing a little bit. I think a lot of folks are waiting on AI day, which is next week, to see what the next phase of Tesla's life looks like. And indeed, if there's something substantive there and when we might see real self-driving, we know that some of the bulls put a lot of emphasis that in their target prices. All right, Ed, hang on. I want to bring in our Ian King and talk about the latest on the continuing chip shortage. The amount of time it's taking for companies to get orders filled has stretched to now 20 weeks. Uh, Ian King, our longtime chip reporter, joining us now. So 20 weeks? Ian, why is that? Yeah, I mean, this is just a continuation. I think many people have been thinking that by now, perhaps, we were going to see this number stabilize. We were going to see some sense that, that things are normalizing, but not the case. It just keeps on going and going and going. So... Uh, the chip shortage is not a secret anymore. We've known this is happening for a long time. Why aren't companies just producing more chips? Yeah, no, very good question. And it's one that just requires constant updating, I think, because, you know, even assuming every chip maker in the world on January the 1st this year decided, oh, we better make a lot more chips and decided to build a new plant, that production won't be coming online until the middle of next year. So you have this, this enormous inertia that goes into building one of these plants. So yes, they can update some of their production lines, they can get new machines, but even getting a new machine, you're looking at three to six months, and then you've got to install it, then you've got to get it to work. So really, you know, the industry just can't turn on a dime, cannot catch up with the amount of demand it's been getting. Ian, when we talk about semiconductors, we kind of speak about them broadly. We lump them all in together. But we've had a lot of car companies report earnings recently saying that the situation's improving. They expect it to get better in the second half of this year. But is that really the case? I mean, there are lots of different types of semiconductors. Is, is it sort of universal that lead times are stretching or are there different parts of the market doing differently? Yeah, no, that's a very good question, particularly for the automakers. Even if you're getting some things but you know some things are improving you can be short of one you know small component that's part of a whole package everything's useless you know the the, the analogy is you know the 30 cent part stops you from shipping the 30 thirty thousand dollar car with this particular report that we've written about today microcontrollers they continue to be really really problematic that's the kind of thing that when you own an expensive car like emily has you press the button and your, <laughs> and your trunk opens automatically. That's, that's a microcontroller at work. On the positive side, um, you know, some of the power management chips that are controlling the battery packs in, say, the Teslas that we just talked about, they're actually coming back. It looks like we're getting more supply of those. Ian, you are invited to see my minivan, which carries my family, including my four children. Um, look, is there any good news that we can expect here? If lead times have stretched up to 20 weeks, I mean, at what point does that start to come down? Yeah, yeah two ways to look at this. The, 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 the scary side would be things are getting worse. You know, supply is getting pushed out more and more, and we're getting worse at meeting demand. The other side to look at it, which is something that investors look at, is like, hold on a minute, maybe this is inventory building, maybe this is, you know, a bit of overshoot, and maybe things have actually reached the peak and we're going to see things normalizing. Maybe this is, you know, a harbinger of, of, the, of the apocalypse in terms of a short-term sort of, you know, return to normal levels, which tends to cause orders to plummet and things like that number of ways okay. you can interpret these numbers, but we are in uncharted territory. All right, Ian King at Ludlow. Thank you both. We'll keep following me and my minivan. Coming up, how AI is transforming the face of fintech. We're talking with lending company Upstart on their earnings report and the future of finance. That's next. This is Bloomberg.
lending company Upstart just went public in December. They're now out with earnings and a full year forecast, which topped analyst estimates. Shares of the fintech company reacting positively at one point up 15%, now 17% after hours, almost 18%. For more on the report and the future of fintech, I'm joined by Upstart CEO Dave Girard, who just joined us after the company's earnings call. Dave, look, investors like what they see. What do you think they're reacting to there? Uh, thanks, Emily. Yeah, I mean, it's the combination of super fast growth com combined with profits. I mean, fintech companies are known for growth, much less so known for profits. So when you can put those two things together, uh, I think people get excited. So you're not just a lending company, but, you know, the, the, the key feature is artificial intelligence and how you're integrating that into the process. Talk to us about how companies are leveraging uh, this technology. Yeah, sure. So we, we operate at not as a bank or a lender, but as a partner to banks to let them use AI technology to originate credit. And that really means more accurate models that will, on balance, approve more people at lower loss rates. And so it's, it's just something when you put it together, it pretty dramatically increases or improves access to credit for consumers. But it also helps banks have more inclusive and more profitable lending programs. That's kind of the heart of AI as it's applied to lending. Are traditional lenders keeping up with the technology and how do you know which ones are and which ones aren't? Well, it's, it's a good question. I mean, it's really hard to compare lenders and, and, and the results of, of lending is sometimes it takes a while to play out. So it's a little hard for the world to actually, you know, completely grasp what's real and what's not because there's a lot of buzzwords flying around for sure. But ultimately, you know, a strong business ends up in, in the growth, it ends up in the profits and in the things that we've, the ways we've measured businesses ad infinitum. And I, and I think ultimately that's what we're demonstrating here. One of the, you know, more positive aspects of this is how AI can be used to make lending more inclusive. Talk to us about how that works. Yeah, it, it, it sounds almost counterintuitive. You think of a smarter lending program as kind of saying no to more people, but it's actually quite the opposite. When, when your model is better at separating who's likely to pay back a loan from who's not, on balance, it ends up approving more people. That's because traditional models are very, very bad at identifying credit-worthy individuals. So a smarter model on balance will approve far more people and it will approve them at lower rates. So that's why on balance, AI, it helps everybody, every demographic you can mention, underserved demographics as, as well as everybody else. So it, it's really a powerful change. Meantime, you have such an interesting window into the economic health of people as we are coming out of a pandemic. So many people have lost their jobs. It's been a tough time for many folks. What are you seeing in that window? Well, certainly it, 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 the economy is not what it was. It, it's different, of course. I mean, unemployment's come down a lot. It's not to pre-COVID levels. Uh, the amount of government stimulus and, and the way that sort of kept certainly uh, credit balances, you know, or, or banks afloat uh, or people, you know, paying back their credit. So it's a very uh, unusual environment. We still view SRLs as heading, you know, operating with headwinds in terms of demand for credit. You know, their uh, credit card balances are as low as they've been in a while. Um, savings rates are up, and that's all good for the consumer. Uh, it does mean credit demand can be down, yet you know we're still growing, which is great. So it's it's a bit of a you know unusual time. I think all of us anticipate in the next two three quarters, you know, returning to a more normal you know economy, where both in terms of employment, in terms of spend rates, and um, I think it's only a matter of when. All right. Dave Gerard, CEO of Upstart, shares officially up over 18% as we had that conversation, up over 18, 17.92% after hours. Thanks so much, Dave, for joining us. Thanks. Coming up, Coinbase President Emily Choi on the company's earnings report. Her take on what the new infrastructure bill means for crypto and thoughts on volatility. Next, this is Bloomberg. with earnings that topped revenue estimates but provided guidance indicating Q3 could see lower monthly users in trading volume. Although Bitcoin dropped from its all-time high in the second quarter, Coinbase went on to say its total trading volume grew 38% sequentially, shares edging slightly lower in late trade. I spoke exclusively with Coinbase president Emily Choi about the latest results and the growth of institutional versus retail investors on the platform.
I think that what we look at on the institutional side is the quality of the different in investors. We talked about the fact that more than 10 percent of the largest hedge, hedge funds by um, assets under custody are now with using Coinbase in some way. On the retail side, a huge part of it. I think that the big thing that happened for us over the past, I don't know, 12 months was that we saw that more than half of trading volumes started to come from institutions. Um, and so this this that was the newer business for us. Obviously, that's a higher volume segment. So it's kind of cool to see both of those businesses kind of taking off separately, but benefiting one another in the whole mix of it with liquidity. Now, you're not providing financial guidance, but you are saying that monthly transactional users will be lower sequentially. Same for trading volume. Why is that? Well, the reality is, is that we're looking at this as a long-term business. So we're looking at this as a period of years, not, not quarters. And our predictability is just not going to be good. We have to, we have to be kind of transparent about that. When we look at this stuff, we just say, hey, there's, there was a ton of volatility this quarter. Volatility benefits our business in a massive way. We had a lot of growth in these segments. And so we're not going to just continue to have, you know, this business that's like a SaaS business where you have kind of incremental up and to the right. It's going to be bumpy. And that's actually the way that we built the business. We're used to the volatility. We embrace the volatility. I talked to you last time about volatility is a feature, not a bug for us. And as long as you're looking at the longer term, I think uh, the business is growing very beautifully, but we're not going to look at it in a myopic quarter by quarter basis. How do you benefit from the volatility? Explain that to us. Well, when prices kind of um, get high or even if they get low, there's a lot of volatility in the market and people will trade regardless of whether or not there's high prices or low prices, right? And so because the fundamentals of our business are based on a transaction model, we're going we're gonna to make money on that either way. Okay. Now, the Senate just passed this $1 trillion infrastructure plan. They couldn't get a deal done on the crypto language, which means that it looks like the crypto industry stands to be broadly regulated. Does this concern you? Does it concern you uh, for the industry at large and also for Coinbase? Zooming out, this was actually a really, really big moment for crypto. And I think it was ultimately a positive moment for crypto, because if you think about this, the $1.5 trillion infrastructure bill was held up because of a small crypto provision that, frankly, um, lawmakers didn't necessarily understand the implications of what that provision might be. And what it speaks to is the fact that crypto is going to be a major source of tax revenue to fund infrastructure. That's actually a very positive thing. And that's that's something that, that we think is really positive for the industry. It's no longer a fringe thing. Crypto has eventually has, has ultimately entered the mainstream here. Um, this was a setback. There's no doubt about it for this past week. But we're playing the long game here. And we think that the more education Coinbase and other members of the crypto industry do with lawmakers to help them understand the potential for crypto, the more we can shape the right regulation that kind of helps make sure we're protecting customers and at the same time, not inadvertently hindering crypto innovation from happening in the U.S. and moving it offshore. Coinbase has been beeping up the policy side of the team. I know you're working to talk with regulators. What are you telling them? What kind of regulation do you want to see? You know, ultimately, we really just want fair and even playing field with the rest of the financial services industry. So one of the really interesting kind of scratch your head moments with, with part of this amendment was thinking about, you know, if you send money to your sister, um, that transaction is not going to require any information about your sister unless it's tagged as something that could be um, something that's dangerous or nefarious or some threshold of dollar amount, right? So if, if you were sending that to through a regular Wells Fargo, for example. So why would crypto be regulated in a different way from the traditional financial services industry? We, we simply want an even playing field with financial services. Yeah, SEC's Gary Gensler um called the crypto industry recently the Wild West, wants investors to be better protected. I mean, what are you preparing for, given these signs we're seeing that crypto will be regulated as a security and not a commodity? Well, I don't think we know that that's going to be regulated as a security. We, we need to kind of figure out what the rules are. So we pioneered this idea of a digital asset framework, digital asset listing framework, where we have a bunch of criteria to kind of determine whether or not we think something is a utility or a security. And at the moment, all that Coinbase lists are things that go under that framework as a utility and not a security. Um, if there are parts of the crypto ecosystem that become digital securities, we think that there will be an opportunity for Coinbase and others to play in that. 
But I think that what we what we're seeing right now is that, frankly, there's there's some confusion amongst regulators about, you know, which parts of the crypto ecosystem they want to monitor, what they want to regulate. And so what we want is just more clarity. We want to work with them on figuring out what the rules of the road are and how we can regulate in a way that, again, protects the, the consumers, protects the customers, but at the same time doesn't inadvertently hinder crypto innovation in the United States because it will move offshore. That's the nature of crypto. Crypto is a decentralized movement. And if you try to kind of put it back, put that genie back in the bottle, it's going to morph into something else in another part of the world. Interesting. Meantime, a huge DeFi hack was just revealed on the Poly Network, a whopping $600 million uh, worth of assets stolen. How big a risk is DeFi for you? This is a big and growing part of your business, given that these kinds of hacks, frauds, scams can happen. Coinbase is built on a, a very big foundation of security. It was the kind of the thing that our founder and CEO, Brian Armstrong, built the company on. And so the way that we've built infrastructure, the way that we add assets, the way that we launch features, the way that we launch products is predicated on this foundation of security. It, and it sometimes slows us down, but in a good way, I think. Um, there's going to be hacks, right? There's, there's hacks in the current financial system. And our responsibility as Coinbase is to make sure that we're, we're kind of doing as much as we can to protect consumers on our platform. When other things have, happen off of our platform, we not, can't necessarily control them, but hopefully we can all learn as an industry about how to better protect against those hacks. So looking at DeFi and decentralized finance and centralized finance, both parts of your business, which do you see being bigger in the future? Well, it's interesting because the whole the whole foundation was built on centralized finance, and then um, our our founder and CEO Brian Armstrong recently wrote a post about how much of the future will be from decentralized financial applications, and I think we don't know how long that will take. Right? We didn't know when the App Store was originally launched, for example, how long it would take for a robust app ecosystem to happen, or when the internet was first launched, how long it would take for um, true internet adoption to happen. I think we can't predict it, but we, we know that the attributes of decentralized financial applications, things like you know enhanced privacy and protection and um, you know the, the, the benefits of the blockchain, uh, permissionless, 24-7, those are things that appeal to users. And so over time, we believe that that's going to be a bigger force of nature, but timing, who knows? Right. Now, you just announced that your VP of Capital Markets, uh, Brett Redfern, is leaving after four months on the job. He's a former director at the SEC. What happened there and what does it mean about your priorities for that part of the business? Yeah, we wish Brett Redfern the best. Um, and this was simply a deprioritization exercise of the thing that he was working on. We always have to make hard calls about different products that we're working on based on what type of demand we're seeing. And we just see so much demand in the core business right, right now that we had to deprioritize that. Um, separately, we think that there's going to be a very robust market for digital securities over time. And part of that, back to your other question about kind of SEC oversight, we, we want to make sure that there's a, a, a good regulatory framework for digital securities, that we actually see market demand for, for digital securities. And when that moment happens, we are very well poised to capture that opportunity, I think. Um, another exchange, FalconX, just raised more funding, $3.75 billion valuation. Robinhood just went public. The CEO, Vlad Tenev, told me crypto is a huge part of their future. They're working on expanding their crypto services. How concerned are you about that competition? Do you see it at all as a threat? We think that the market opportunity for crypto is massive, and we welcome players into the space because we think that we all grow this together. And when we see players such as PayPal and Robinhood and others get into this space, for us, it's just a key validator of all the hard work we've been doing since 2012. Um, I think that the, the thing that folks should understand is that as users become more sophisticated, they want crypto first features and assets. And that is what we are well poised to do, right? So we added more assets this quarter than we did in all of 2020. You might come in to buy one asset, and then we're going to expose you to other assets through our Earn platform. You'll learn about them. You might want to use other features beyond buying and selling. You might want to send and receive. You might want to stake. And so we are the crypto first company. That was the thing. That's the heritage of the company. That's what we we're built on. And it's, it's, it permeates everything we do. You can imagine back in the day when some of the kind of old school retailers were like, oh, we'll add digital as a feature. That didn't 
do great against something like Amazon, which was digital first. And so I think in the same way, we believe crypto first is, is going to be the key to our future. An exclusive interview there with Coinbase president Emily Choi. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Join us tomorrow. We're going to hear from the CEO of the flying taxi startup Jovi Aviation. Paul Schiara will be with us after the company starts trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Also, Greylock Partners and LinkedIn co-founder Reid Hoffman, who's helping to take Joby public. You don't want to miss both those interviews. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.